Hello, and welcome to the Walrus Leadership Forum, Fueling the Sheep Recovery. I'm Jennifer Hollett. I'm the Executive Director of the Walrus, and we are thrilled to be joining you online on International Women's Day. I'd like to start by acknowledging the land that I'm on in Toronto, Ontario, to Toronto. A land acknowledgement helps us recognize history, thinking about how it informs where we are now and what changes can be made going forward in a commitment to reconciliation. Our offices and my home office, we are located within the bounds of Treaty 13, signed with Mississaugas of the Credit. This land is also the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Today, Toronto is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We're really honored to carry on a long tradition of storytelling. We welcome you to reflect on the land that you're on wherever you're joining us from today. As part of the ongoing work of reconciliation, if you haven't done so or haven't done so recently, we encourage you to read the 94 calls to action recommended by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And we'll share that link now. A bit more about the walrus. The walrus is committed to being a platform for Canada's conversation, challenging, urgent, complex, and thoughtful conversations like the one we're gonna have today. And we do this in a number of different ways through our fact-based journalism available in print, but also online at thewalrus.ca, through our new podcasts, The Deep Dive, and in our event series like this one. This work is powered by our donors, supporters, and partners. So thank you all for being here and a very special thank you to our longtime partner, YW Calgary, for working with us on this event. Today, we'll be discussing the she session and the she recovery in Canada. COVID-19 has been hard. We're all still feeling it. It has left an impact on everyone, but especially women. And we've seen it. We've seen it on Zoom, the childcare, the teaching, the double, triple workload. Women were the first to leave the workforce, at the start of the pandemic, and will be the last to return. The lack of affordable childcare still leaves women behind when it comes to jobs. However, there's a lot to celebrate today. The passage of $10 a day childcare legislation and the impact that that will have for women, families, everyone across the country. The pay gap is narrowing, more women are in leadership positions and executive roles, and we're pushing deeper into intersectionality. There is progress being made. To start today's conversation, I'm really excited to welcome the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development, the Honorable Karina Gould. Hello and welcome, Minister. Over to you. Great, thank you. Sorry, I was just uh, coming off mute there. Um, Jennifer, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to participate today. I want to give a big thank you to the Walrus and of course to the YWCA uh, of Calgary for hosting this event. I am joining you from my home in Burlington, Ontario, which is located on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, uh, Ojibwe peoples, and it is the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, today's conversation about the she session and then the she recovery is so important. And quite frankly, we're not going to have a she recovery without affordable, accessible, high quality and inclusive childcare. I am so thrilled that to date, the federal government has signed agreements with 12 provinces and territories. We have one more to go and I remain optimistic and I am committed and rolling up my sleeves, making sure that we get this done for families in Ontario, as we have for families right across the country. In fact, uh, families who are joining from Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Northwest Territories, uh, Nova Scotia, PEI have all seen a 50% or 25% reduction in fees for Nova Scotia families uh, already, and there's much more to do. And one of the things that you mentioned in your opening remarks, Jennifer, was the fact that without affordable childcare, 
women are being left behind. But I have had the incredible experience over the past couple of months to hear from women about how they are being included and how they are stepping forward and stepping in to the recovery. Michelle from uh, Edmonton uh, gave a great interview in on CBC talking about how because of the reduction in childcare fees, she's actually going to accept full-time work. And that is going to mean more uh, resources for her family. It means more control over her finances for her and her family, and it means greater opportunities for herself, but also for her broader her broader community. We know that child care is a win, not just for children, but it's a win for families, especially mothers, and it is a win for the economy as a whole. When we talk about the recovery, uh, we have a labor shortage here in Canada. But if history repeats itself um, and women in Canada join the labor force in the same rates that women in Quebec did 25 years ago, that's an estimated 240,000 people right here in our country who are here already uh, who can join the labor force. And I also just want to take a moment to acknowledge that uh, Quebec has shown incredible leadership. They are celebrating 25 years of affordable child care in their province. They went from having the lowest female workforce participation in the country to now having the highest. And we want to ensure that we can do this right across the country. So on International Women's Day, I'm really excited to be talking about this smart, feminist economic policy that the government of Canada has put forward that we are collaborating with uh, partners and provinces and territories, indigenous leadership across the country. And of course, to acknowledge the um, hundreds and thousands of advocates who have been uh, advocating and working on getting this policy into fruition for over 50 years in Canada. And here we are on March 8th, 2022. Uh, we're almost there. We've got one more province to go. We're going to get it done and it's going to be meaningful for our entire economy and our entire society. Thank you so much. Now, before we let you go, I'd love to ask you a couple of questions. Minister Gould, not too long ago, you made history as the first federal cabinet minister to give birth while in office. And uh, I see some artwork behind you, very cool kids artwork. I wanna know what's it been like for you being both a minister and a mom to a toddler in the pandemic? You're living it. Yes, so I can absolutely relate uh, to families uh, across the country throughout the pandemic uh, when child care was closed for those first uh, six months of the pandemic, I had my son Oliver here at home with me. I remember hiding in the basement to try and take calls with uh, various world leaders because I was the Minister of International Development. And at one point, even, um, you know, probably a lot of parents can relate to this in that, you um, my son, when I was home, expected that I was home. I was away a lot, right? I was traveling for work quite a bit. I'm in Ottawa often Monday to Thursday. And so he was okay with that, but he expected that when mom was home, that was his time with me. And so the transition uh, for a two-year-old um, was really difficult that he couldn't quite understand why I was home, but I wasn't available. And um, fortunately, um, some of the uh, colleagues that I was interacting with understood this very well. And one of them um, at one point during a meeting in which my son was crying quite heavily and you could hear him in the background and I asked if I could just excuse myself for a minute. Um, I brought him back and uh, the gentleman that I was speaking to said, would he like a song? And he picked up his guitar and started um, singing some children's songs uh, for my son, which calmed him down. And then we carried on um, with our meeting. So it's, um, definitely barriers have been broken down. I think worlds have crashed between professional and family life, and it's been hard on all of us. Um, but I think one thing that has changed and I think will continue to change is that um, we're not going to pretend that we don't have kids anymore um, and that we don't have family responsibilities and we need to figure out um, the way forward uh, in terms of managing uh, that I don't want to call it work-life balance because I, I usually say my life balance is more towards work and more towards life at different points in time as opposed to getting it completely right. But I think, um, you know, it's been hard, particularly for families with young children. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I hope that we take this 
transparency and honesty and support and creativity that you just described in a moment of pull out the guitar. Let's take it back into the new world ahead. One other question for you. As a society, where are we, where are we at right now in terms of placing a value on, on child care? Because this uh, announcement in the new legislation is a game changer, but um, it's, it's not just for families. No, it's for it's for everyone. Um, and maybe I should just say that International Women's Day is special for me because it's the day my son was born as well. So he turns four today. Um, Happy birthday! Yeah. <laughs> so I like to call him a born feminist. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> so, but when it comes to valuing childcare, look, sometimes you got to strike while the iron is hot, and that's exactly uh, what our government did in the sense that. It took, unfortunately, a global pandemic for society as a whole to recognize how vital childcare is to the functioning of our society and our economy. Um, you know, you just you just can't be as productive, quite frankly, if you've got um, you know little kids who need your help either because they are at that age where they need constant attention or when you're trying to manage online school as well. And so employers, organizations, CEOs, economists on Bay Street kind of finally woke up to the fact that, oh, wow, childcare really matters for our economy. And we're not going to be able to get people back into the workforce if we don't make sure that they have access to safe, reliable, affordable, accessible childcare. And, um, you know, it's something that uh, I believe very strongly that if you're going to take a feminist approach to the recovery, you can't do it without childcare. But we as a society can't function without it. Um, you know, we need people to be in the workforce. We need people to be doing these things. But as a parent, you can't do that, A, if you can't afford it, but B, if you don't have confidence that your child is being well looked after. And so um, I think it's an exciting moment. I can tell you that when I was knocking on doors in 2021, um, almost unanimously, people said, get us this child care agreement. We need it as a society. And so I think that places incredible value on the role that child care plays, not just for women, although women have known this for, you know, well over five decades and well, even before then, that this is something that we need to function as a society, but also in terms of our economic recovery. And so I think there is, um, very uh, clear, um, uh, you know, co coalescence around the fact that childcare matters, and it's a good thing for our kids because it's going to set them up for success. It's a good thing for families because it helps with their bottom line. Childcare payments are often equivalent to a mortgage payment. It's good for women because they can get back into the workforce, stay in the workforce. I'm really excited 30 or 40 years from now to see what impact this has on poverty rates of senior women. Um, and then it's also good for our economy. So um, there's, there's value placed there. We've got 12 agreements. We're going to get that last one done and we're going to have a Canada wide early learning and childcare system. Well, thank you so much for your time today and your work. Thank Happy you. Happy International Women's Day. Happy International Women's Day. Next, I'd like to welcome YW Calgary's Chief Executive Officer, Sue Tomney. Sue has led YW Calgary for more than 10 years. She sees the challenges women and their families in the Calgary community face every single day. She's seen firsthand the toll this pandemic has taken on those already vulnerable, as well as the added challenges that it has presented for women to fully participate in the workforce. It's been quite the year, and it's been one year since we last met on the virtual stage. So, Sue, welcome back. So nice to see you. Oh, it's great to see you. Thank you, Jennifer. And yes, here we are uh, a year later. Um, I'm delighted to be greeting you from Mokinstis, uh, the traditional Blackfoot name for Calgary, where we reside on Treaty 7 lands. And uh, yes, last year at this time, was our inaugural event for the Why Whisper Gala uh, with the Walrus, where we partnered. Uh, I'm not sure we, we thought that we'd still be doing virtual, so much virtual a year later, but here we are, and I'm delighted to be back and, and participate here today. Um, a year ago, we talked about, we referenced the She Session, and it was a bit of a new term then, and, and listening to the minister's comments, uh, it's, it's something we've all become very familiar with, and so it has been a challenging 
year. Uh, and But it's been a year of, of tremendous opportunities, which was also referenced by the minister in terms of, of childcare and, and what's transpired. For the YW, uh, we actually implemented a new strategic plan, uh, which people questioned, I think, sometimes, why would we do that uh, in a moment of crisis? And I'm forever grateful that we were able to achieve that and have the board approve it, because we really needed to focus on the future, knowing that we would emerge and we would need then to have that North Star. So our new strategic plan that focuses on domestic violence, uh, as well as mental health uh, and women's economic prosperity. And so uh, that for us is a shift in focus primarily to from crisis to prevention. So we talk about moving from a place of crisis to independence. And so for us, that has uh, been a huge opportunity in the last year that we've been focused on. And that includes the development of our new Sheriff King Home Domestic Violence Shelter construction uh, is underway for that facility, uh, as well as an affordable housing uh, site as well on that, uh, on that same site, 20 units of two and th three bedroom uh, units of truly affordable housing for women and children fleeing domestic violence. We know how critical housing is as well uh, for women to be, uh, to be independent. So, and, and I think if I look back on this last year, it was also a year of first where we elected our first uh, uh, female mayor in Calgary, uh, as well as the first Indigenous Governor General um, uh, came to us in the past year. So those are, those are first. It's showing us that there's some momentum. Uh, it does say that we have a ways to go. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to the conversation here today and to be part of it. Thank you so much. Now, I have a couple of questions for you. When we spoke a year ago, also close to International Women's Day, as you mentioned, we were looking at the She Session and specifically Child Care for Women. And I know YW Calgary was very instrumental in moving forward the new child care legislation. So congratulations. I'd love to learn a bit more about that work and what's gotten us to this point. Yes, and, and you know, thrilled to be able to participate uh, on behalf of four YWs. We have a number of uh, YWs in Alberta. And so we were able to bring that lens and I was thrilled to be able to be part of that committee uh, that Minister Schultz uh, pulled together to help get that historic deal across the finish line. And it truly is historic. Uh, my children are all adults. Uh, I can tell you my life would have been much different with affordable quality childcare and how things transpired being a woman who always wanted to work. And so while I've missed the window, I'm so delighted for my children um, because it's going to have tremendous opportunities for them. And the fact that we were able to, to have our lens on how childcare is delivered uh, in, in our communities, I think was, was hugely important and feel very proud that we were uh, able to help um, get the deal done, so to speak. Thank you so much for your work on that. Uh... The term shadow pandemic has come up a lot lately, which has to do with the increased gender-based violence since restrictions have been keeping us all at home. How is YW Calgary approaching this shadow pandemic? Well, it, it, it's such an interesting word because I think it manifests itself in many different ways, Jennifer, and, and certainly mental health supports will continue to be a growing area of focus, uh, something that we have been uh, involved in for, for decades, actually, and including our Mindfelicity program, which uh, we implemented in the past year, which talks about microaggressions and how to deal with conflict in the workplace. And so uh, in the last year, um, we, we saw increased demand, not surprisingly. We were, uh, in terms of numbers, had over 600 counseling uh, sessions last year with women and men who came to us. Uh, 2,000 calls or more than 2,000 calls from women who were seeking support. We also had to turn away over 2,200 women from our domestic violence shelter. Wow. So that's the harsh reality of why we need to get in front of uh, that issue. We'll never have enough space. And so moving to intervention and being able to use counseling and uh, assisting that way is going to be critical uh, in order for us to, to uh, address that issue. Well, thank you so much. I think it's important that we don't lose sight of this issue, that we continue to talk about it and keep it front and center. Uh, Sue, any final thoughts? Um, 
just that I think we're coming out of a challenging time. And uh, we, we have opportunities, though, to work differently. Again, listening to the minister's comments, which I think is exciting. Uh, it won't be what it was, uh, you know, in January of 2020. And, and I, I don't think that that's a, a bad thing. I think we have an opportunity to, to really build on the technology uh, that we've had to implement in the past couple of years. It, it gives us an ability to broaden our reach and to deepen our impact. Uh, and, and we know as well, again, uh, to the minister's remarks, women are critical to the economic recovery. So affordable childcare, which has been quality childcare, which is a, a huge barrier, is part of the solution uh, so that we can bring women back to work and get our communities back on their feet. Uh, and we're just really excited to be partnering again with you uh, and the Walrus uh, and listen to, to the panel, including the role that men play in an equitable future, having two grown sons. Uh, I'm, I have my own opinions and I'm really looking forward to those, those comments. Uh, and, and just lastly, I, we have 50-50 draw tickets still available. I'd, be, I'd have my team mad at me if I didn't do a plug on that. Yeah. We, rely, we rely heavily on donations and the support of the community. And so uh, those tickets are still available. I encourage people if they can to purchase a ticket and, and really uh, thank you for, for supporting us. And uh, also a quick plug, March 8, 2023, the Why Whisper Gala in person will be back International Women's Day next year. I can't wait, never thought I'd say this, to put on a gown and high heels uh, <laughs> again. So uh, looking forward to that. Great, thank you so much, Sue. Now to our audience at home, we wanna hear from you. I'd love to know where you are joining us from today. Let's see. I know we have folks, okay, in Nelson. Hello, Nelson. Lethbridge, Canmore, Winnipeg. Hello, Montreal, Halifax, of course, Calgary. Toronto as well. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, this is the, the technology that Sue is mentioning that makes it possible for us to, to gather. And I'm so glad that we can be in conversation today. We also encourage everyone who's joining us, please share your thoughts, share your reflections on social media, take a screen grab of how you're watching us and tweet it out, post it on Facebook or Instagram, tag us at The Walrus and say, happy International Women's Day. If you have a question for any of our panelists coming up, you can enter it at any point in the comments and chat, and I'll do my best as the moderator to get to as many audience questions as possible. All right, now it's time for our moderated panel conversation. As I introduce the speakers, I invite each one of you to turn on your camera. Joining us today, we have Alicia Dubois, CEO of the Royal British Columbia Museum. We're also joined by the Honorable Margaret McCain, Chair, Margaret and Wallace McCain Family Foundation. Jane, uh, Jake Sticka is also with us, Executive Director and Co-Founder of Next Gen Men. Welcome, Jake. And Lena Yousefi, Lawyer and CEO with Y Law. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Hello. Hello. Well, the theme for International Women's Day this year is gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. And I want to know what that means for each of you, especially hopefully soon coming out of the pandemic. Margaret, I'd love to start with you. What does that theme mean to you? Gender equality. Uh, well, uh, opportunities that are opened uh, as much to women as they are to uh, to men, and that of course provide that means uh, the the uh, providing the special supports that women do need, and women are they are different, and they do need the the special supports usually in childcare. Yeah, that's such a big one, Lena. Gender equality to me is um, us females not be afraid anymore to speak our truth and to create business practices and policies that um, are at least half female centric instead of 99% male centric. I love my male counterparts, but we, there's no way we're gonna be able to uh, achieve equality without being unafraid. So that's one of, the, one of the things that I do on a daily basis 
um, to advance gender equality. Thank you, Alicia. I think it's about finding a balance of demands and expectations so that they are shared um, amongst the genders. And so that opens up space for women to show up in ways that they just haven't been able to before and and men too because it is it is about a balance so um, for me it's um it's it's both a personal and a professional um, consideration thank you alicia and i just want to recognize that gender isn't a, a binary we are focusing on, on women but uh, also includes genders plural trans and non-binary folks uh, jake what does the theme mean for you this year I mean, I think we've had a brilliant conversation about women's roles and identities in society over the past 70 plus years under the banner of feminism and, and have made some progress with much more to go, but we've been missing a parallel conversation for, with, and about men in, in regards to gender equality and, and our role and what we stand to gain from it. And again, to your point, gender being beyond the binary. So I think, uh, you know, when we move that forward and, and we, we continue to broaden norms and stereotypes for everyone, we all stand to benefit as, as a culture, community, and society. Great, thank you. Uh, Margaret, I know the Margaret and Wallace McCain Family Foundation and you specifically, your leadership, have been heavily involved in bringing the affordable child care legislation into effect. With that theme, how is that going to impact families today or as it rolls out? And then what will it mean looking ahead the, the tomorrow? I'd love for you to take us a bit deeper. Well, I'm, okay, I, I'm happy to. But I, I want to say that the minister spoke eloquently and explained a lot of the uh, important points. Uh, today, of course, it is, uh, the money's already starting to roll out and making a difference uh, to families who, who, you know, the childcare costs have been so exorbitant. I'd like to speak, maybe just add a little bit to what the minister said. Why is this so important? It is, um, as uh, we know it's important to women. We know it's important to children. But what's going to make it sustainable for the future and its economic value is the early learning piece, the early learning and care piece. What it amounts to and why it's so economically important it's because we, this system, and it's not a program, it's a system that we are tending to build from coast to coast to coast, which has to be high quality. Uh, it, what is so critically important is that we are going to be developing and nurturing and preparing our people for the future. And that's why it's going to be sustainable because it, is, it has value, not just to women, not just to children, but to the whole of society, in fact, what it is is nurturing our human resources, which in the future will be our most important resource, more important than any of our natural resources. And because of that, our government is, as we speak, preparing the legislation to pass it so that it will be permanent. In fact, it has been equated by many people to be as important to our health and well being in Canada as universal health care. Now, because of that, so it is important to women and children, but because it's important to everybody, to the whole society, it's a, to our social and economic prosperity, that's why it's going to be sustainable. So it is a historic event, historic year. The pandemic was very hard on women, but look what it did for women. It brought this about. So there are two sides to the coin. It has brought us this, what we've been, we knew we've needed for a long, long time, but it, the importance of the whole society story is what is going to make it sustainable. Great. Thank you so much for that. Now, Connected, I want to touch on parental leave. Alicia, uh, in straight relationships, mothers take it, but fathers are often discouraged from doing so. There are a lot of, let's say, cultural norms and barriers, uh, which present a double standard. I'd love to hear your thoughts on workplaces, on how they should approach parental leave for all genders. Yeah, we had a quick uh, conversation about this as we were prepping as a group, and um, it was it was really robust. So I'll invite Jake to jump in and feel free to interrupt me. But um, I think that one piece that is missing is rather than looking at um, programs that are specific to and limited to, say, female mentorship or sponsorship, those are very important uh, mechanisms. I think one of the most important mechanisms that especially corporate Canada can 
can utilize is actually encouraging pat leave for the men in their workforce. Um, that action in and of itself is uh, really signals a support for women and the advancement of women in the workforce, but it also helps to balance it. I'm going back to those balancing demands and expectations of people. And so, you know, by not just making pat leave available, you know, and then seeing eye rolling when somebody actually wants to take advantage of it, but encouraging it, like making it a very, you know, celebrated positive thing it allows for the other half of that partnership to, you know, dive back into a career and, you know, play a bit of that catch up because, you know, there is a sense of disconnection when you take mat leave, um, you know, whether you're leading your team or you're just part of a team. And when we start to see that experience being shared across the genders, I think that's when we're really going to start to see women begin to advance because if we look at the stats the pipeline for the for male and female individuals into senior management when they're in the pipeline the numbers are 50 50 but for some reason in the very senior executive management we see that drop to you know 30 for women and it remains high at 70 percent i'm using approximate values for men and um, and we see that alive and well. So these are stats that are from the Prosperity Project, where 82 CEOs in their corporations across Canada contributed to this data from just 2021. So you know these are these are live statistics that we're talking about. So you know the the balancing of expectations and demands, opening up the door so that there is much greater balance on all fronts for for men and women. I think we're going to, you know, hopefully we'll start to see a greater balance in um, the proportion of men and women in those very senior executive roles. Thank you so much. And, and, and Jake, your work with Next Gen Men is all about changing the culture in which we raise our boys, which includes fathers. I would love to learn more about in your work, how creating a healthier society for men also creates a healthier society for women. Totally. Well, to build on what Alicia was saying and what the minister said earlier as well, and, and kind of Quebec's leadership around this, um, you know, I don't have the exact statistics in front of me, but when we think about uh, Quebec leading Canada and women's workforce engagement, a lot of that has to do with men's use of parental leave. It's over 80% in Quebec compared to the rest of the pro uh, provinces across Canada. I have to Canada. give that snap. Like, th that's totally. incredible. Yeah. Uh, and, and especially when you compare it to the other provinces, that's about 11 or 13%, right? That's a, that's a huge statistical difference, right? And so, um, you know, men are embracing that opportunity. And the tough part, not the tough part, but, um, you know, it's actually a great opportunity to practice empathy because um, there is the empathy that they feel for women when they go on parental leave to say, oh, well, you know, they're sacrificing this project or that opportunity and, and they don't necessarily see that for themselves. But we can't have these conversations about what men stand to lose. It's actually what we stand to gain from it, which is deeper and more intimate relationships with our partner in, in being there from day one in that child rearing process with them. Uh, intimacy and a competence that we have with our children that we actually understand what they need in those moments. And they're not just handed to us with a to-do list when we get home by a tired partner. Um, and then to, to build on what the Honorable Margaret McCain was saying about just the investment in uh, our children and our human resources from a really young age, when we have involved and engaged fathers from day one, that compounds over a lifetime and those youth have much better outcomes when it comes to social emotional development, academic performance, all those kinds of things. So all of these things play on each other. And um, us as men, you know, if we're going to talk about gender inequality, the system that we're up against here is patriarchy. And there's so many ways that patriarchy harms men and boys. And so there's just so much for us to gain to show up to these conversations, not just on International Women's Day, but the other 364 days of the year as well. Great. Thank you so much. I think it's important uh, to Margaret, your point of, of systems, right? That we also acknowledge the system that, that we're in. So thanks for bringing up the patriarchy. Uh, Lena, why law is the fastest growing women led law firm on the West Coast? Why is that important and what does that mean? 
I'm, go I'm gonna come, you know, I, I was just listening to like all these different ways of, you know, bringing gender equality, but you know, the, the one way that I'm trying to bring gender equality into the workforce is not to accept leave as a concept. I don't like leave. I don't like uh, expecting a woman to immediately turn off her career, go home and stay at home full time. And then, you know, within six months or a year, be expected to literally leave that child who's, who, who's so like grown attached to and be working, you know, like including travel, sometimes, you know, 10 to 12 hours a day. That's a huge shock to the system, not just to the child, but to the woman. And for some reason, we expect that to happen on a daily basis. You know, like we have policies saying, we'll pay you for the first four months of your leave and then, then it's gonna terminate and you're gonna have to figure out a way and you know, you're know you forced to come back. And that doesn't make sense to me. So like when I had my own child, I, I worked like, so I, I cut it down to one hour a day after the first month, then it was two hours, then it was three hours. Then I had her come to my office. I breastfed her for two years. She was a part of my career. As since the time she was one month old, I was seeing her every few hours and I was having a little bit of an attachment to my career. I didn't terminate my career and terminate my business that at that point had about, I think 20 people. Now we're almost at 40 people. So I was able to double the business, be a mother to my child, breastfeed her as I was working and be able to continue that. So then I was like, you know, why don't I do it for everybody else? I started recruiting women who are pregnant, recruiting women who are on mat leave, giving them that flexibility to choose how many hours they want to work a day and when they want to transition from a mother back to the career woman without shocking their own children and their own families. And that's been working amazingly because what I look at is the long-term investment that we're putting in these women, not the short gain goals and gains of, you know, you can only take four months or six months. It's that this is a relationship that's going to last for a long time. You're going to come and you're going to go as your life comes and goes. And I'm going to be here to support you because at the end of this long-term plan, we're both going to benefit. I'm going to have your loyalty and you're going to have my flexibility in return. So I, you know, that's something and you know i really love these initiatives about you know the ten dollar daycares but still there's also this issue of how flexible are we being by forcing women to go um from you know being mothers to being full-time workers and you know there's nothing in the, in the middle i want to change that and i also want to change that for men it's the same program that i offer to men and our next step is to have an on-site daycare um, for all women and men so that they can go downstairs and, you know, see their babies and, you know, breastfeed and take an hour for lunch and be there instead of, you know, feeling like they don't have a choice. It's, it's to give back that choice to women and, and design our workplaces around what they also need and not just, you know, the, the men or a hundred year ago policies are telling us to do. Lena, you are lighting up the comments section here. We have a lot coming in. Thank you. Chat. Uh, Laura writes absolutely spot on this concept of, of leave, which can be doubly destructive. Uh, and, and actually you brought up at work childcare, which Victoria was asking about. Um, uh, Victoria writes, what about at work childcare? Having them completely separate is a very Victorian notion. Uh, we could integrate daycares and workforces and for that matter, elder care. Older people gain a lot from playing with children and helps many of them stay mentally healthy and less isolated. Nadia writes, this sounds like a dream. Kudos to, to Lena. Uh, again, just like very creative uh, policy. Margaret, my question for you, uh, you, you mentioned the importance of, of quality care and you know, some of the work that remains. What can you tell us about at work childcare? Like, is that, is that common? Are we gonna see more of that ahead? Uh, I don't want to disappoint everybody. Hey, bring, <laughs> but we're bring it real, bring it real. <laughs> we're, as much as I, I totally agree with Pat leave, I think it's, it's equally impo uh, as important as Matt leave. Uh, building the relationship between the father and the child is as important as building the mother, relationship with the mother and child. So I want to say that off, off, right off the bat. I believe that, uh, the, uh, but paternal leave should be shared by both parents. It should not be all father, should not be all mother. 
However, we are building, uh, we're, we're building a public education system downward that includes early learning and care. And we have found that the best way to, to uh, improve the learning piece is to make it part of the public education system. And if it's going to be publicly funded, and eventually I want you to know that we expect that, that will be, there will be no fees, just as, as there are no fees for public education uh, from grade, uh, from uh, kindergarten on. So uh, workplace, I'm gonna say that, uh, I, I don't see that happening within building the system. But however, you have to remember that most parents will have more than one child and, what, and maybe the other child will also be in the school and the, the, the child care center will be in the same building. So it, 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 in effect, it actually in the end will be more convenient for parents. Be one stop, drop off, one stop, pick up for, for, their young, for all the young children. Thank you so much for that. And thanks again for all the comments coming in in the chat. If you have a question for one of our panelists, feel free to ask it and I'll do my best to get to it. Alicia, I, I wanna come back to you. You've worked extensively in, in law and the corporate finance world. I'd love to learn more about your experiences in, in different fields and in terms of conversations that were happening at the boardroom table or not happening. I think too often we're not talking like this. Yeah, the, the beauty of this is um, it gets people out of the in the box thinking. I loved listening to Lena because I had uh, my oldest during my undergrad. And so she was three when um, she and I moved to Toronto for law school. I went to law school at U of T. And the beauty of having your children there, I mean, I was broke, but um, the beauty of having your children there is actually that flexibility. Um, she often came to school with me. I could go and pick her up in the middle of the day and go play at the ROM or, you know, take her to go do something in the day. So there wasn't like this, this rigid need to be away from her for, you know, from 830 in the morning until five o'clock at night. And it just meant the bond between us was so, it, it was just so easy. Um, you know, I ended up having two more children afterwards while in a, in the midst of a career. And like the the leaving them all day long was like you know it, it's hard, it's really it's really hard and it's hard on like all parties involved um the law was interesting because it, as compared to um my time in finance because when i did start in the law it was very it was very balanced from a gender perspective they could, going to law school was sort of 50 50 but interestingly having had emily young um, there was no way I was going to apply to a job on Bay Street because the firms were interested in FaceTime and somebody had to pick her up and drop her off um, from, you know, daycare. And so I ended up going into um, the Crown's office. Um, so, you know, and we actually see a much greater proportion of women in Crown corporations and, and especially in leadership roles than we do in corporate Canada. So it's interesting that you know, the government scenario is a bit more forgiving and welcoming and 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 ha gives some um, flexibility as far as, uh, I think it's work hours. I think the demands are not the same. I think there isn't a need to be out at events and going for dinners with clients, et cetera. So you actually have a much more structured work day, which works, you know, aligns well with daycare hours and school hours, et cetera, at least better than sort of the, the heavy firm work. Um, but finance, you know, you're going into a place where you have clients and there are extra curricular sort of requirements around, you know, managing client relationships. It involves dinners, it involves events. Um, sometimes it involves a bit of, you know, travel outside of your local region. And that, that is a very unforgiving place for, um, for, for parents, and especially those that end up sort of bearing the, the brunt of, of the family care when, when that's not shared. Um, another thing I wanted to raise too is like, we can think even further outside the box. Um, I was really shocked when I got to visit um, Copenhagen to learn that in Denmark, women get the first year of mat leave off and as soon as they're done, the dads get the second year. 
So like the children have a full year at home with the mother and then the mother goes to work and that's when the dad's pat leave for one year kicks in. This means that children are home with parents for two years straight in those really formative, like bonding years. And they get a chance to build these incredible relationships. And, and it's, it's a given, like it's just part of their culture as a nation. So it's not that, you know, people are convinced that, you know, maybe you want to do this and they have to fight some sort of um, stereotype or limitation in the workplace. So, you know, the, the importance of these conversations is that we keep thinking outside of the box and find that balance. I want to bring Lena in. Lena, I saw you nodding. You know, this is your world as well. Uh, love to hear your thoughts on uh, law and traditional corporate environments and how you've intentionally been creative and, you know, worked away from, from that norm. I mean, don't even get me started about law. Step over here. We want to get you started. <laughs> law is, it's unbelievable. As lawyers, we try to like advance the rights of everybody, you know, like we're advocates. And for some reason, women in law are some of the most discriminated against human beings I've ever seen. It starts from when you go for articling, you know, I, I hired a student who said that a partner at a large, large law firm said, when you come to the interview, if I see the wedding band, you're already not getting um, the job because we, we immediately think that you're probably going to go on maternity leave, you're going to have a kid or you're going to have a family. We need you to be billing, you know, your time, if anybody's familiar with the billing concept, basically, you know, selling your soul to us as much as you can, especially in those formative articling years. So I've been um, a one woman tribe <laughs> against all the, all the big firms, because I know that every law student coming out of law school right now is feeling this discrimination, both men and women, they no longer want to do it. It's, it's huge. It's the biggest thing right now in the legal industry that the bigger firms are losing talent because of their lack of flexibility. And they're literally, in my mind, are performing at a level that they did 100 years ago when it comes to discrimination. What's happening is they're inducting women into partnership. And trying to make that seem like there's some sort of an equality, but there's not no equality about that because equity lawyers who are women still have to bill as much as a man does while having kids, while cooking the food, while making sure that the children are, are fed. And when they get to that partner, they're still not leaders. All they are, they're equity partners. They're getting a share of the profits. So I know of very few, if not, no firm in Canada of my size that's been able to be woman led. And there's a problem with that. I've worked myself to the bone to show that I can lead a law firm, I can set my own policies and I can make sure that it's successful so that the women that are following me can see that, it, that, that this also works. And what's making me so happy, especially with the introduction of four day work weeks for our law firm, which is basically unheard of for a firm our size, in Canada, we're showing that we are the fastest female-led law firm in Canada while working four days a week, while letting women work part-time, while allowing women to go on mat leave and have a work-life balance, and we're retaining more talent and loyalty than the big firms. And so what I'm trying to do is to shift this mindset that success can be obtained without selling your soul, without having to let go, without separating yourself from your identity, because that's no longer working. So I, I, I and I need a lot of people to buy into that um, concept because it's a very difficult fight. Like, <laughs> you know, you're, you're compete, competing against very well established firms, but it's, it's starting to track a lot of attention and it's starting to actually make them think of their policies and make some changes, which I'm seeing happen. So I think the future is bright. Lena, you are creating the case study. Thank you so much. Uh, Jake, I want to come back to you. As we talk about gender, there are so many traps for women, for men, for folks who are trying to break through the gender binary. I have a lot of faith with this rising generation because they see gender is very fluid. I'd love to just learn a little bit more about conversations you're having the work you're doing with men about gender and, and, and how it really limits us all to creative thinking or um, seeing what's possible. 
Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, it starts from a very young age. You know, Sue gave the, the word of uh, YW's work around prevention and being really upstream around it. And um, I think that there's multiple levels and layers in and around this. And, you know, um, you know I, I, I'm on this panel in the spirit of engaging men and boys. And, and the way that I think about it is, is through a bell hooks quote uh, from her book, Will to Change. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing a bit here, but the first act of violence that patriarchy asks of men is that against, or is not that against women, but that against themselves. And should they fail to psychologically and emotionally cripple themselves, they'll be met by a group of men that will do it for them. And, you know, I myself experienced that. I know that it's, it's the experience of, of many of my male peers. And so when I think about shifting that, you know, there is a breadth of gender expression that I think, um, you know, women and, and trans and non-binary people are, are kind of afforded. Like uh, femininity often is kind of a, a given, but in, in gender theory, we talk about precarious masculinity and how it always needs to be performed and reaffirmed. And it, it kind of it breeds this culture of competition. And so I just think that there's so much work that can and needs to be done in engaging men and boys in these conversations so that we can show up as equitable partners in this gender justice world that we're all working towards. Um, and, you know, we're behind. We haven't had these conversations. I'm in my mid 30s and it took me a mental health crisis to come to the conversation around gender. And, and most men enter the conversation through either traumatic events or through the birth of a child when they're handed a tiny human being and told here, program this. And so, um, you know, I think that um, those norms really need to be dissected across the board and, and there's lots of opportunities to do so. Well, Fatima K in chat says, love that quote by Bell Hooks. Thanks for sharing it and using it in your discourse, Jake. And I have to say, Bell Hooks, rest in power. If anyone wants to take away today, get a Bell Hooks book, anyone. Uh, it's all about love and there's just uh, so much great, great thinking and, and, and learning in there. Wow, we have covered so much. Thank you all for being a part of this engaging conversation. There's so much more to say, but we encourage you to continue this conversation at home and bring some new people into these types of discussions. Thank you again to Alicia Dubois, the Honorable Margaret McCain, Jake Sticka, and Lena Yusefe. Thanks again to Minister Gould for joining us today. And thank you to Sue Tomney and everyone at YW Calgary. Also, thanks to our annual sponsors, Air Canada, Inspire, Labatt Breweries, Meta and Shaw. And thanks to everyone at home. I have to say it's it's been great just seeing your, your comments and your yeah, I agrees and in, in, in chat. Uh, lots to chew on today. YW Calgary is responsible for making this leadership forum possible. They are the largest and longest serving women's organization in Calgary. They are leaders in ending family violence, homelessness, and poverty, and work towards a future where women can live in safe and equitable community. To support their work, go to ywcalgary.ca. We'll share that link. I'll be making a donation, encourage you to do so as well today. We'd also like to thank YW Calgary's International Women's Day event sponsors, Enbridge, Anne, Jane, and Roxanne McKegg. I believe the McKeggs have a small in-person gathering, so hello to them. Dentons, Moore, Nutrien, Papella Law, and the Calgary Flames Foundation. What a lineup there. If you enjoyed today's event, we have more. Next Tuesday, March 15th, the Walrus Talks at Home, Youth and the Climate Crisis. And what's so interesting about this event is, you know, that anxiety you feel when there's like a warm day in the middle of winter, it's taking environmental anxiety and using it to motivate us to make change. And then on Thursday, March 17th, Brain Canada presents the Walrus Leadership Forum, Technology and Treatment. This is a dynamic discussion about emerging solutions for mental health challenges facing Canadians. And I know we touched on that today. There's some questions in chat. So this is where we're gonna go deeper into mental health. Also, if you'd like to learn more about $10 a day childcare, the Walrus has you covered. Our next issue, which is coming out in May, delves into childcare legislation, both here in Canada, but also abroad. So keep an eye on newsstands. Um, it's gonna be coming out very soon. Also visit us online at our website, thewalrus.ca slash events. That's where you're gonna find our schedule. You can register for the upcoming events I mentioned. 
Also, we post all the videos, the full videos, the clips from these events. So if you want to watch them again or, or share with family and friends. Also, keep an eye on your inbox. We're going to send you an email as a follow-up. And if you'd like to attend future events um, and read the cover story that we just mentioned, the best thing you can do is opt into our newsletter and we'll tell you what's uh, coming up so you don't miss a thing. Community is so important in these COVID times and each one of you is a part of the Walrus. Thanks again, everyone for tuning in and being present. It was such a rich conversation. I couldn't think of a better way to be celebrating international, Women's Day with you all. I think uh, the conversation really got into the details, but also pulled out the things that we need to celebrate as we push forward for change. Thank you, merci miigwech, happy International Women's Day. And again, I encourage you to have a similar conversation with someone in your life today. All the best. <laughs>